right. Well, I think we're um we're in good shape as your slides are now on the screen. So if okay, I could great. just um, have the pleasure of introducing you, Nate. So for everybody who's joined us online, thanks um, and welcome to the TIA Centre Seminar Series. So today we're joined by Nate Brahman. And Nate recently, in 2020 in fact, received his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Case Western Reserve University. And he worked in Biomedical Image Analysis and since then, he joined Tempest Labs, working on multimodal machine learning in glioma and other diseases. And now he's the senior director of AI at Picture Health, where he's leading a team building precision med medicine tools, leveraging radiology and digital pathology to improve care across the cancer journey. So today, I believe, Nate, you're going to be presenting your work on multimodal um, machine learning. So we're really excited to hear what you've got to say. Um, and anybody who's got any questions, please feel free to either raise your hand or um, just type in the chat and we'll field those as we go. So thanks a lot, Nate. And whenever you're ready, you may start. Sounds great. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Simon, for that uh, very kind introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here um, and talk to you all today about multimodal uh, imaging biomarkers. Um, uh, uh, so I'm going to be focusing on integrating modalities and also illuminating modalities, specifically radiology and digital pathology, for the purpose of uh, pre precision oncology. Um, so Simon mentioned, uh, you know, I was previously at Tempest and before that case Western. So I'm going to be today presenting some of the work I did at uh, both of those places. Great. Um, so let's dive on in. So I probably don't have to sell anyone on the call uh, on the promise of uh, imaging AI in uh, cancer care and the care of uh, other diseases. Um, but a really exciting you know, uh, shift that uh, the field has gone in uh, within the, the last few years is, is, is what I've put here, moving from present to future. And when I say this, I'm not being philosophical or poetic, I'm, I'm being quite literal um, in that, you know, in, in the, the first successes in imaging AI were really focused around things like detection, diagnosis, staging, segmentation, all of these things you're um, detecting or measuring uh, some finding that is already present at the time of imaging. Um, these are existing tasks in the clinical workflow um, that could currently be performed by an expertly trained reader. -er. And these problems are largely bounded within a, a single modality. So this set of problems, I, I, I think, boils down to the question of what is here? Now, more recently, there's been a lot of exciting work um, applying some of these same tools uh, to, uh, to a different set of problems, predicting future events in order to guide care. So this is things like, can we determine how a patient will respond to a given treatment? Or can we, what's their prognosis? Will they have adverse events? Do, what's the likelihood of metastasis? Now, unlike the problems I, I just discussed, these characteristics are things that are indistinguishable to the naked eye, regardless of the web, level of expertise, expertise. They haven't happened yet. Um, and also in contrast to some of those problems, there's no certainty whereas where we should be looking or, or, or what is kind of uh, going to help us uh, make some of these predictions. So, this set of questions boils down to what is going to happen. And these are very different uh, types of questions. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we're looking for very different things. The nature of these problems is very different. However, in the context of uh, predictive AI, a lot of the work that has been published to date has really sort of followed the game plan that uh, we've used for some of those, uh, you know, diagnostic detection tasks. Um, so as we all know, uh, there's a lot of 
uh, different data and measurements that are required over the course of cancer treatment, patient will likely undergo biopsy uh, from which we can obtain um, uh, pathology images. Um, we can also send that tissue sample out um, for molecular profiling. Um, uh, and we can also, that patient will certainly undergo one or more radiology scans. Um, and there's also, you know, a variety of cl clinical data that's uh, available, things like, you know, what's their age, weight, and gender, but also things like what, what's the stage of, of the tumor, um, what's the diameter of the tumor, all of those sorts of things. And a lot of the work in this space to date ha has basically picked one of those uh, different modalities and um, said, okay, we're going to train a model, for instance, for predicting outcome from digital pathology, or we're going to use radiology images, and we're, we're going to train a model to make a prediction. Um, this is all well and good, and there have been a lot of really impressive results uh, utilizing these sorts of strategies, but it's also a, a very car, far cry from how some of these questions are currently answered in the clinic. Um, if a patient now uh, has cancer and we're trying to figure out how to treat it, the oncologist and, and a team of uh, uh, other specialists, including the radiologist and the pathologist are going to look at all of these different types of information and information and you know, consider them according to their strengths, what they tell us, um, what new information does each provide. And after holistically considering all those different streams of data, then they use that to form a treatment plan for, for, for a patient. So a model for uh, predictive AI that more closely resembles this cl clinical workflow would be to have a single uh, uh, AI model or neural network that uh, incorporates all of these uh, different data types and like the oncologist can weigh them based on their strengths and generate a combined prediction um, of a patient's outcome and uh, pass that along to the caregivers, which they can then be utilized to form a treatment. Um, yes, question. Yeah, um, what, what happens when, so I assume here you're, um, you're assuming that every patient will have a, a certain um, amount or certain type of molecular profiling, for example, but not every sample, of course, will have the same um, level of molecular profiling. So what would happen in that case? Absolutely. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think um, for this sort of a, a crucial uh, element of, you know, being able to really robustly, um, reliably train these models and also apply them is uh, a crucial thing we're going to have to develop is capability to handle that data missingness. Because it doesn't even have to be a question of, um, you know, we didn't send out uh, the, the molecular profiling model was trained with. It can even be sometimes like the radiology has an artifact. So that's not usable, or uh, you know, the the pathology has uh, an artifact. So you're always gonna have some degree of missingness. Um, mm -hmm. One strategy would be to just say, well, sorry, this is like really only that it, it's you have to have all these things. But I think more realistically, the way this field is gonna progress is that we're gonna figure out how to train these models in ways that can handle incomplete data and compensate for that. Yeah, great. Great, um, cool. So, um, but there's some challenges here though. Um, uh, one, assembling these data sets is really hard. It's really hard every time you add a new uh, type of data um, to a model, you are going to have uh, attrition of, uh, you know, the usable cases uh, for training. Um, so when you have, you know, multiple different modalities, you require, you know, outcome information, your data set gets small really, really quickly. Associated with that is curating these data sets can be quite painful. Um, because often these different types 
of uh, data live in different places uh, within the hospital ecosystem. So um, it's very challenging to compile it all in a single place. In addition, uh, you need the multidisciplinary expertise to build these models. You know, I might be very experienced with radiology, but not know as much about pathology or sequencing. Um, so it's really important to assemble those skill sets. And finally, there's the dim dimensionality concern where as you add additional uh, variables and um, uh, especially uh, variables from different modalities that might have different scaling or, or different network structures, you, you have to be able to ac accommodate that. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to ask these questions as, as they come in on the chat. So Great. Saad said, um, do you have any opinions on early, mid and late fusion of these modalities? Yeah, uh, that's that's a great question. My opinion is basically, you know, in, in an ideal scenario, I think the fusing things early is, you know, you have you have the best chance of discovering, you know, complex interactions between uh, modalities and, 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 and making a stronger prediction. That being said, uh, that only works if you have sufficient data. And like I said, oftentimes you do not. So I don't think there is a single one size fits all um, fusion strategy in, in, in terms of uh, when we're integrating our different modalities. I think it's something that we have to um, be flexible on based on how much data we have um, and, and how our models perform. Does that address your question? Hopefully it addresses Saad's question. Um, yes, he said Great. that has addressed his question. So thanks for that, Nate. Great. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk about how, um, you know, in spite of these challenges, um, what are the current um, needs within uh, predictive AI, within these, these unimodal models that have been kind of the, the standard for a long time now uh, that we can address if we have uh, multimodal data. And th there are a lot of these, um, but the way I've structured this talk is I'm going to focus on two of them, um, each one, uh, and for each one, we're going to go through through a use case to discuss. So, th so the first I'll be discussing uh, today is, is what I've called high stakes problems without training wheels. So when we're, we're trying to predict something that will guide how a patient is treated, that is a very high stakes problem. We could have, if we get that wrong and the patient does not get the care they need, that is pretty calamitous. We have to um, you know, uh, get those decisions right, um, have clinicians be able to know how to work with that, uh, work with them. But there's an additional uh, element to this here that you know, whatever we're, we're predicting or capturing is inherently going to be uh, sub-visual. Clinicians can't do it with the naked eye. So as opposed to uh, problems like diagnosis and detection, we can't have the clinician uh, come through and check our work and uh, sign off when it works and, and correct it when we get things uh, really, really wrong. There, um, there's basically no, no way to confirm that the, the subvisual, you know, the, the neural network is being told, uh, correct in assessing that the patient's likely to respond to treatment. So the bottom line here is for these predictive AI tasks, trust and interpretation and interpretability are going to be critical. So the strategy to combat this we're going to explore is multimodal cor correlation. So in, if we have, you know, a unimodal uh, predictive signature, um, that might be black box or, or, or relatively obfuscated, we can uh, increase the interpretability of that model uh, by, by uh, comparing with other modalities to try and ascertain, you know, what is the tumor biology that this, uh, you know, this signature might be uh, capturing. And, and the nice thing about this approach is, you know, this is something that um, is, is relatively data cheap. So you can do this with 
um, relatively small uh, data sets. I think this is like kind of the lower end of the spectrum in terms of uh, multimodal approaches with respects to um, data set size and complexity. So the use case we're going to be discussing around this um, is a radiology signature uh, to guide breast cancer targeted therapy uh, that we also demonstrate to be predictive of genotype and histologic phenotype. Okay, um, the second problem that our, our, our multimodal approach uh, can address is the fact that what we're predicting here has multi-scale complexity. Again, differing with uh, a problem like diagnosis, um, the question of whether a tumor is gonna respond to treatment or metastasize is the culmination of a large number of factors across um, uh, a variety of scales. So, you know, it's a product of, you know, what is the molecular composition of that tumor? It's um, uh, a function of what does the tumor microenvironment look like? How is the body's immune response? Um, you know, uh, how is the uh, perfusion of the tumor? All of these things come together. Um, and if standard of care is drawing from a number of modalities to make tr this treatment decisions, it begs the question, is it always feasible to do it well and reliably from one alone? And even if we can, what are we leaving on the table by, for instance, only considering pathology and ignoring radiology or uh, molecular profile? So the bottom line here is by building multimodal AI models, we might be able to more holistically estimate prognosis in the same fashion uh, that is done clinically. And the strategy we're gonna explore here is multimodal fusion, um, a multimodal deep learning framework uh, th that can combine modalities according to their strength to improve, a to yield a improve a fuse prediction. And we're specifically gonna be talking about an orthogonalization based deep fusion of radiology digital pathology sequencing and clinical data for prognostic prognostication of uh, glioma outcomes. Okay, any question before I, I dig into some of the details here? I think we're good for now, thanks, Nate. Great, cool. Okay, so the first use case uh, centers on multimodal correlation. So I'm gonna be talking about paper we published back in 2019 in Jim and Network Open. Um, and this paper, uh, revolved around um, the question of HER2-targeted therapy. So HER2-targeted therapy is uh, current uh, standard of care um, for HER2-positive breast cancers, which is roughly every one in five uh, breast cancers. And, and actually, it's, it's, this is a, a population that's probably going to be expanding soon uh, based on um, some recent findings uh, at, uh, presented at ASCO um, showing that uh, patients who are considered HER2 low can also benefit from a treatment including HER2 targeted therapy. But among this HER2 positive population, over half of patients, this is a really effective treatment, but even still over half of patients that receive targeted therapy will ultimately not respond. We do have markers that can better stratify this, this subset of patients by benefit of HER2-targeted therapy, we can perform um, molecular subtyping to subcategorize HER2-positive uh, tumors in a variety of response-associated molecular subtypes. In particular, there's this HER2-enriched subtype. Uh, these patients have a much better response to targeted therapy, but um, uh, th this testing is invasive and it's also quite costly. So it, this is not currently uh, standard of care. Um, and, you know, uh, the really our objective here is starting with trying to, is there a radiology a presentation of this genotype? So I'm going to talk really briefly about um, some, some of the, the, the radiology stuff. So I, I talk about radiomics. So this is a, a term that refers to mining radiology images through a combination of feature extraction and machine learning te techniques for use in uh, clinical prediction. Um, 
And we'd previously in 2017 uh, showed that um, a subset of radiomic features, um, texture-based heterogeneity measures extracted outside the tumor in the peritumoral region was really a powerful predictor of how a patient respond. But we still had a poor understanding of why that was so discriminative at this point. And I'm not going to get too much into the, the, the radiomic side further than that, but I encourage anyone who's interested to check out our recent uh, review paper in Nature Review's Clinical Oncology that uh, centers around using radiomics and deep learning techniques to predict uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, problems, response to treatment prognosis uh, using radiology images. So, I'm going to run through uh, the experiments uh, in this study relatively quickly. Uh, please uh, let me know if you need me to slow down. So this study consisted of three steps. The first was training a radiology signature uh, to predict, to identify this HER2 enriched uh, molecular subtype. So you can see here up top is a HER2 enriched patient, a patient who is non HER2 enriched. Um, and what you see here, this is the region outside the annotated tumor. And these, uh, these red regions in indicate uh, greater heterogeneity within this peritumoral region, which was a key, yes. Just, just out of interest, what, what kind of radiology scan is this? Is this a mammogram? Oh, this is, this is MRI. Good MRI, question, okay. thank you. Sure. Yeah, so this is more specifically, this is uh, what's called a dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. So the, the patient is uh, uh, given a contrast agent. Um, and then uh, we uh, uh, image them several times. Okay, cool, thank you. Great. Um, and uh, you can see here like this heterogeneity, increased heterogeneity in the, the environment of this cartoon rich subtype uh, is a distinguishing feature. And we developed a signature in cross-validation within these 42 patients uh, that had a really high performance in terms of identifying the subtype. But next we said, okay, we know this molecular subtype should be associated with response to targeted therapy and therefore so too should our uh, radiology signature. So the, the next thing we did was went to two external cohorts, um, patients where we didn't have molecular subtyping results, but we did know whether they uh, responded uh, to targeted therapy. Um, so you can see here uh, on the left, this is a patient who had a pathologic complete response, which is what we want to see, and a patient who is a non-responder. And we see the same sort of uh, heterogeneity patterns uh, outside the tumor in these patients who ultimately responded um, within our two cohorts, achieving AUCs between 0.69 and 0.79. But we still didn't have a great understanding of why these uh, properties could distinguish both molecular subtype and uh, outcome. So we wanted to look at um, what underlying biology could be uh, driving the signal. So uh, our next experiment, we, we looked at for a subset of 27 patients who had uh, biopsy samples uh, available. We had those uh, digitized and we ran uh, a model for nuclei and, and lymphocyte detection, and we quantified um, uh, till density both within the tumor itself, um, which is annotated here in green, uh, green and also within uh, the uh, tumor margin. What we found is that the same heterogeneity patterns um, were significantly correlated with uh, till density in, in both of these regions. Um, so this, I think, uh, the, the reason I, I like this study, I think this is, you know, a very, you know, if you're going to take this to an oncologist uh, and, and try and make a treatment decision on, uh, based on this, if you show them, them this, they will have no idea what to, to do with that. This is not something that is, is obvious to a clinical, uh, 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 clinical expert. But if you're able to, yes. So, of course, um, 
measuring um, whether or not some some um, tissue sample or some patient is HER2 positive or negative is typically done via immunohistochemistry, right? So what, yeah. what kind of difference in performance is there between the radiomic signatures and, um, or well, from the H and E and also from IHC, what kind of differences in performance should we should we expect? Yeah, great question. So there's a little bit of a nuance here in that. Um, so her two um, positivity is assessed via IHC or fish, um, but this is actually this. All of the patients we're we're looking at here are after. Um, after they've had that test and been deemed HER2 positive. Okay. So within this HER2 positive population, there is, um, we can perform molecular subtyping right. that further um, separates those patients out into, uh, you know, these molecular subtypes of HER2 positive. So I wouldn't use this signature for assessing which patients are HER2 positive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think IHC is, is the gold standard there. And I know there's been some work showing impressive results on that from H&E alone as well. Um, I, I, would, I don't think that's something that we would do from the radiology, but once we've done that test and we wanna say, okay, how likely is this patient to respond to the standard of care targeted treatment is when we would apply the signature. Perfect. We've got two more questions come in as well. Yes. Um, first one, standardization and reproducibility of radiomic features across different scanners and cohorts is a concern. Was Absolutely. this validated on external data? Yeah, great question. Um, so one thing we did, so we, um, you know, everything was intensity normalized. Um, another thing uh, that we, we generally do when we're, we're trying to externally uh, validate a cohort. Um, we'll, for instance, take a look at, um, you know, uh, within the, uh, for those who don't know, uh, radiology images uh, uh, typically come in DICOM uh, format, and those have a bunch of metadata associated with them. We look at the distribution of uh, some key metadata fields, so things like um, uh, the, uh, the resolution, the slice thickness, um, uh, the, the scan manufacturer. And, you know, if there are any disparities there, um, that's something we correct for. Um, we will also do like, for instance, um, look at like, um, you know, an unsupervised dimensionality, sort of like something like, like a UMAP to try and uh, determine, you know, without looking at the labels, whether it, that we expect a large a domain shift, and if, if we find that to be present, then we interrogate it from there. Um, uh, when you have the right data, um, a something to do that also helps in this is is looking at, for instance, um, uh, pre-screening your, your features by by stability. Uh, for instance, looking at test retest data and eliminating features that are really uh, variable between two scans from the same patient. Great. Then the next question from Fayaz, what was the number of HER2 positive and negative cases um, in the radiology and pathology examples? And also what was um, the number of ER, or what was the ER and the PR status of these patients? Yeah, great question. So, um, in terms of the, um, I, I assume you meant um, uh, HER2 enriched status versus HER2 positive, because all of these patients were clinically HER2 positive. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a mix of HER2 enrichment. I'm, I, it's been a while since I've really gone through this, this paper. I'm not sure on the exact numbers. For some reason, it's sticking in my brain that this cohort had 19 HER2 enriched patients. Take that as you will. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the exact numbers were. It was roughly um, between uh, half to a third were HER2 enriched in, in all of these cohorts. Um, okay. And in terms of hormone receptor status, uh, it, it was a variety. 
of uh, different uh, receptor uh, hormone receptor statuses. And in fact, um, the molecular subtypes that uh, we explore here do roughly coincide um, with uh, the hormone receptor status. So for instance, the HER2 enriched tend to more commonly be ERPR negative, mm -hmm. um, but that, that that's not uh, a, like a, a definitive rule. There's some patients that uh, don't um, fall into that bucket, which is why you need the sequencing. Perfect, thanks, Nate. Great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and so just to reiterate here, I think, you know, what I like about this study is, you know, we were under data constraints here, but by, you know, kind of taking this step-by-step -step approach and, and, and looking at all the different um, modalities of data that were available, where they were available, we have a really good sense of not just that the signature works, but why it works. And the reason I, I, I go over this example, which you know is predominantly a radiology paper with what's mostly a, a pathology audience, is I, I think it's important to emphasize that you know this progression we had here of the radiology to the molecular data to outcome to pathology, you can travel that path in any order. So um, you can start from pathology and uh, correlate that with the molecular data, but also the radiology data to get a sense of like, what is the macro phenotype? Like, um, you know, what's the perfusion? Um, what, uh, what, what does that uh, tumor actually look like outside of that limited biopsy? Great, okay. So let's move on to use case number two, uh, multimodal fusion. So this is uh, a paper we published at uh, uh, Mackay 2021. Um, before I begin, this is uh, work I did at uh, Tempest. I'm no longer at Tempest and, and nothing I say uh, reflects the company. Okay, so uh, just for some background here, um, as I mentioned earlier, AI models focus on radiology, pathology, molecular profiling. Clinical information have all separately uh, shown promise for predicting patient outcome. But this diverges from real world clinical decision making, which incorporates all of these things in a holistic fashion. So it stands to reason that if we can find a way to combine all of this information within our machine learning framework, we could likely boost performance by explaining the relative strengths of each modality. Um, there previously, there's been uh, some really excellent work in multimodal fusion. Um, two in particular, Chen et al., Mobidersani et al., um, uh, have shown really strong uh, benefit when combining biopsy based modalities. But so far, um, that work has just been uh, limited to pathology and, and sequencing. Uh, the, there hasn't been, at, at least when this work was published, uh, no uh, attempt to also integrate radiology in this sort of uh, deep learning uh, prognostic or prediction uh, based framework. But in order to do so, we face some additional challenges. First, as I mentioned earlier, lower data availability anytime we, we add a modality. Um, in addition, um, you know, as we add more modalities, there's the presence of correlations that exist be, uh, between modalities, uh, which can create redundancy and reduce the benefit of actually adding those modalities in. We want to get to uh, the, the relative strengths of, of uh, those modalities, what they can contribute that other modalities can't. But it can be tough to deconvolve that from uh, the inherent correlations, expect, especially when you're really limited in terms of training data. So uh, just briefly uh, on, on the clinical problem, um, we set out here to predict prognosis and stratify uh, glioma patients uh, by risk according to uh, over, overall survival. Um, our data set consisted 
of 176 patients um, uh, uh, collated from the TCGA GBM and TCG LGG data sets that had available radiology pathology DNA and survival data. Um, so here we were necessitating an 100% overlap between uh, all, all of these different modalities. And one thing you can appreciate here, uh, along the, the point that I made earlier, how much um, the, our training set size drops just by necessitating that we have radiology. We go from uh, a cohort of uh, 769 patients in some of those previous works work to just 176. So as we continue to add in modalities, uh, you know, our data missing this problem is going to become worse and worse. Yes. So I would have thought at some point, if someone's got um, glioblastoma or low grade glioma, they're going to have to have a scan. So what's the reason for there not necessarily being a one to one mapping here? Yeah, great question. So um, it has more. It has more to do with the TCG data. Those okay. patients, no doubt, um, uh, had scans, but I believe only certain TCGA sites also uh, uh, supplied radiology data. Okay, cool. So no and doubt, it is somewhere. Perfect. And I'm going to ask another question that came in earlier. I think maybe now yeah. is a good time. So you've got a drop in the amount of samples. But how, how much data really is enough to train these models? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I mean, we see that, um, you know, we can get a strong performance at this like 176 mark. Um, but, you know, it's, I think, as you get further and further down from this point, I imagine this becomes more and more challenging and you, you really start to run into the risk of overpitting. One thing that we had to do in order to make this work that I'll be talking about uh, later is um, being really deliberate in our sampling strategy. Um, so, uh, you know, augmenting both the radiology and pathology images and also being deliberate about how we pair those up to create new uh, or unique data combinations to train that model. Um, so this is certainly, I think, um, you know, I, my hunch is that uh, if you had a hundred or fewer, you would, that's a, a around the point where you'd start to need uh, a simpler model, at least for a task this challenging. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for something like diagnosis, uh, you could get away with. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is uh, our framework. Um, we call this approach deep orthogonal fusion. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna walk through it uh, step by step, but interrupt me uh, if you, you have any questions here. This is depicting, by the way, combination of radiology, histology, and sequencing. We also uh, looked at um, uh, clinical variables as well. I didn't know how to make a four dimensional cube, so I kept it to three here. Um, so the first component of this network are um, these unimodal um, embedding networks. So I'll talk about the specifics of each of these a little bit later, but each of these is uh, a network uh, handling a single uh, data modality. And they're going to be first uh, pre-trained um, to predict um, uh, uh, survival from a single modality alone. And then we're gonna use the penultimate layer of that network as an embedding um, that's gonna be used as pre-training for um, our fusion step. So we can move over here. Um, here are our, our embeddings from uh, each modality. Um, we apply to each modality a gating-based attention mechanism. Um, and then we uh, capture interaction between modalities through a tensor fusion operation that captures the individual features itself, but also uh, interactions between two modalities, three modalities, uh, and four, and so on. Um, and um, we get this, this matrix of features, which we then flatten 
and uh, send into our outcome prediction layers. And um, we have a supervised training loss here. That's a pretty standard Cox partial likelihood loss. And then we have one additional term that we've introduced here uh, that we call MMO, MMO loss or multimodal orthogonalization loss. Um, so the purpose of this uh, loss function is to um, force these unimodal embeddings to be as independent from one another as possible. So uh, try and force uh, the, the, the radiology uh, network to give us uh, different information than the pathology network and the sequencing network and so on. Yes. So I'm assuming these um, data types have, have very different um, input dimensionalities. So how, yes. how would you combat that? Do you have to modify the, the networks corresponding to the dimensionality of the data input? Yeah, great question. I'm actually, the next two slides, I think, dives into that. Um, so if does anyone else have any other questions while I'm here? And then I'll get to uh, that question next. So sorry, sorry. I'll, yeah, I have a question if I may. Please do. Yeah. Well, I might have missed it. How, how do you crop the region of interest from solution images? Do, do, you, do you have like cropping of all the regions in all side or just take the specific region based on pathologists or comment? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I get this into this a little, a little later um, too, but um, so basically we were using um, uh, one of those two papers I mentioned, uh, Mabur Dasani et al. Um, they actually pre-process uh, the um, uh, pathology images. And what they did is they created 1024 by 1024 uh, patches um, from uh, the slide images. And they did one to three of those patches uh, per slide. Um, and then from there, we're doing five, 12 by five crops within, within uh, those larger patches. Yeah, thank you. Yes. There's no more questions online. So unless okay. there's any more from people shouting out, then I think we can move on. Great. Cool. OK, so yeah, let's talk about how we handle uh, these different data types. So um, yeah, you're, you're correct. We have, we have different um, architectures for um, some of these different modalities. Um, uh, for the pathology side, we're using a pre-trained BG, G19 is a feature extractors, and uh, we have some fully connected layers uh, that winds up with an embedding of uh, 32 um, features. Um, uh, these are, like I said, the inputs are 512 by 512 patches at 10x. They're cropped from larger 1024 by 1024 uh, uh, patches. Um, our radiology network differs from this. so. Um, one of the things to accommodate on the radiology side is um, typically brain MRI uh, patients will receive multiple different types of scans. Um, so this here, this is uh, a, what's called a T1 post contrast image. You can see this like um, uh, kind of lights up the tumor. This is a, a flare image. This more so lights up the edema region. So they both tell us different things. We're taking each as uh, inputs to its, their own convolution arm, convolutional arm. Again, a pre-trained VGG-19. Um, we're taking crops that are half the size. We're doing 256 by 256. And we're also uh, including a very small set of handcrafted radiomic features. Um, so all of this uh, these things are processed separately and then together, and we wind up with one radiology embedding. Great. Um, and then we have two modalities with tabular data, uh, DNA, and clinical variables. Um, so we're using a self-normalizing uh, neural network here to generate embeddings uh, for these. Um, so the only thing that differs between these two networks is um, the number of input units for uh, DNA, we're utilizing 81 features, including 
gene and arm level copy number variation, as well as IDH mutation status. Um, and for clinical variables, we're using uh, a, a set of uh, four, 14 clinical variables um, that TCGA had available. Okay. Um, was that a question? I don't no. think it was. Okay, great. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit more about how we're training these models. Uh, like I said earlier, two um, loss functions. The first is a Cox partial likelihood loss. Um, this is uh, a supervised term that's training this model to uh, continuously predict um, a risk score that ranks patients uh, by survival. Um, this is pretty standard. Um, uh, we're utilizing here theta. It's, that's just the output of the final uh, linear later, layer, which is also uh, corresponds to the log of the hazard ratio. And um, we're utilizing uh, event status, so whether a patient was dead or censored, and as well as time to event. Uh, I'll go into this last function. Um, the multimodal orthogonalization loss, which again, the purpose of this is to um, encourage our embeddings uh, to be as independent as possible, um, is based on an approach uh, called orthogonal uh, low rank uh, embedding that was uh, developed for like as an unsupervised clustering strategy. Um, but here we're using it um, to uh, 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 make our um, uh, modality embeddings as um, uncorrelated as possible. So what you're looking at here, the lowercase h, this is an embedding from uh, some modality M. The capital H is an array combining, co containing uh, embeddings from all of the modalities. Um, and the key here is this, this operation around each of these, which is the matrix nuclear norm, uh, which is basically just the sum of its singular values. So what this loss function is effectively doing is it's incentivizing the, um, uh, the variance within individual modality embeddings to be as low as possible, but also the variance within that combined set of embeddings from all modalities to be as high as possible. And this is what is going to uh, enforce our network uh, to create embeddings that are independent of one Okay, so I had a question earlier about uh, uh, the sampling strategy. Um, I'll start with the pathology since we've already discussed that. Uh, so we had one to three, 1024 by 24 uh, pre selected ROIs per patient. Yes, question. Yeah, un un unless like so. It's, I'm wondering, so, so you, the, the purpose of that last function was to make the feature representation extracted from different modalities as different as possible. So you would have like more information extracted, right? Exactly. So kind of. Um, but, but why would you need that? Because, so as, as far as I understand, you use the same convolutional feature extractor, right? So images and information from different modalities are pretty much different. Therefore, the feature maps, the feature vector extracted that will be different anyway, won't they? Yeah. So um, would it make more sense if you want to like make the feature representations from all, all the modalities that have different appearances look the same? I mean, it's just, right. just a, a naive idea in my head. Oh, so so to enforce them to be um, uh, like correlated? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's a really good point. And there's actually a really good um, paper exploring this, this, uh, um, this idea uh, by Chirla et al. Um, uh, I can send it in the chat later. Um, but their, their, their scheme is kind of the inverse of ours. They uh, ensure that um, the modalities are as similar as, as possible. It's a good idea. It has different strengths. So one of the things 
One of the things that's really nice about that strategy is then you can be much more robust to modality messiness, right? Because, you know, if you should be getting roughly the same embedding from all your different modalities and you don't have radiology, that's way less of a big deal. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, so, so that's absolutely a, a reason why that approach uh, might be, um, uh, you know, a good way to go. It, it also, you know, you, you're really, you will like hone in on whatever, like is kind of like the dominant uh, signature there uh, that is like really most driving outcome prediction. And, you know, you're going to, that signal is going to be stronger and more consistent. Um, one of the things that motivated us to try the opposite in this work is um, in glioma, one of the, the, the really, the, like two really prominent markers, um, IDH mutation status um, and uh, the, the grade. Um, so those are two very strong variables. Uh, they do well on their own. And, you know, one of the things we wanted to anticipate and offset here was the, the, those properties are distinguishable on radiology and pathology and, you know, molecular data as well. We didn't want to just come up with a very complicated way to approximate um, those variables that we already have. That's great. Thank you very much. Great. Great question. OK. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, back to the pathology. So we had these 1024 by 24 samples. In training, we were doing a random 512 by 512 crop uh, with augmentation. In inference, we, we did like um, uh, nine corners from each uh, of these 1024 patches and, and, and consider those as our pathology samples. On radiology, um, basically what we did to enforce um, uh, uh, a diverse sampling of the tumor uh, during training, basically we divided, um, this is a picture, we're, we're looking at the z-axis. So we're, we're looking down into the brain and into the tumor um, here. We divided that those slices into four quadrants. And during training, we selected one random sample somewhere within each of these quadrants um, uh, to you know, ensure we were getting random samples, but also that we were seeing the full length of the tumor. And during inference, we, we basically took the sample um, uh, from the center of each of those quadrants. So we had four samples from radiology and one set of genomics and clinical data. Um, and basically what we did is we, for inference, we generated a prediction on each of these uh, combinations of our different data. We created a distribution of the risk score and we took the 75th percentile as the patient level risk score. Okay. Um, so uh, let's get into the results. Um, so all of these models were, were trained in 15-fold uh, Monte Carlo cross-validation within this data set. Um, the best performing modality was the combination of radiology, pathology, and DNA. Um, and we evaluated that model at several different weightings of the MMO loss, as indicated by gamma. Um, and what you can see here for, for this model uh, this modality combination is at every weighting of this uh, orthogonalization loss turn, we get better performance than training uh, for survival prediction alone. Uh, and we achieve the best performance here at uh, a weighting of 0.5. Uh, so we have we trained uh, all the other models at that weighting as well. Okay, so this is the full set of uh, results for all the different uh, modality combinations, uh, everything except the UMO models trained with both Cox loss and the combination of Cox loss and the orthogonalization loss. Um, you can see 
the radiology model performs the best, but the pathology and the DNA are, are relatively close. Uh, the clinical model didn't perform as well, um, which I suspect it's kind of a trend too, also in some of these modality combinations. Uh, I suspect is due in part because the, the, the clinical data uh, included in, in, in this TCGA data set is not very high quality um, and, and contains some uh, outdated um, uh, like clinical stratifications. Um, so again, this radiology plus pathology plus DNA was model trained with the MMO loss. It's the best performing model. Um, the model trained uh, with all four modalities was the best performing model of all the ones uh, trained with Cox loss alone, which was an interesting find. Um, but looking across these multimodal models, eight of 11 of them improved when the orthogonalization loss was uh, included in training. Okay, um, so uh, so here's some, um, yes. Just to say, if you can wrap up in the next minute or so, I'm not sure how many slides you have Absolutely. left. Yes, I, I can make this super quick. Um, Thanks, Nate. So uh, these are some Kappa-Meyer curves comparing risk groups from our model with grade and IDH mutation. As I mentioned, these are very powerful uh, clinical markers for glioma. We're performing about on par with them. And, and more importantly, we can look within some of the subsets of these variables. Um, and we find that our model is uh, still prognostic. So this is really important because it means, you know, this, the, these predictions do have uh, value that's independent of, you know, those dominant uh, clinical markers uh, that I mentioned we, we might uh, fear uh, kind of uh, dominating the signal. And we can perform, provide value in some of these already known prognostic sub. Um, so I, I, will, I won't uh, read through the, the summary here. Um, uh, I, I think the, uh, the main takeaway is this first bullet here, like the, the importance of a multimodal approach um, to de develop predictive AI biomarkers um, that can utilize all the different data that's currently clinically available and also support clinical trust through um, uh, uh, increased interpretability uh, correlation with multi-scale tumor biology. Great, yeah. thanks, Nate. That was fantastic. Great. Really brilliant Great. presentation. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. I know we're one minute over, but if you're okay to answer a few more questions, that'll be that'll be brilliant. Absolutely. I'm all yours. Okay, so we have a few online. The first one. Um, so this is. Um, referring to when you extracted your clinical variables from TCGA. And there's a note that these clinical variables might vary based on when the TCGA dataset was acquired. Um, is mm. this a potential problem? Interesting. So I, I don't know. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing it depends when, um, uh, when um, you know, they were pulled from... Uh, uh, the portal, uh, you, you mean by that? Like the, those clinical variables are being updated? Um, yeah, yeah I, Saad, Saad um, asked the question. So if you if you want to add to anything, Saad, then please feel free to speak up. Yeah, you're right, Nick. Um, uh, even great. that, plus like when um, also the, uh, the institutes who, you know, sort of contributed these data sets, uh, kind of put those in and when the grading scheme was, uh, what the grading scheme was back then. And I think you answered that question. Oh, so yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yep, it's, it's, it's absolutely outdated. And, you know, we, in the paper, we point that out as one of the likely reasons that the clinical variables didn't do um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, one of the things going into this model were the, this outdated uh, grading scheme could be fighting against the model. Um, in terms of like the, the variation in the clinical variables, so we grab them all at the same time. Um, I don't know if that addresses the issue or not, but I think kind of regardless, um, you know, whether that specific issue is evident, I don't have a ton of faith in that uh, TCGA uh, clinical data. I, I know there was also 
some some missingness that we just had to fill in in a couple uh, variables. So um, you know, my my hunch is that model would do quite a bit better if we had really well vetted uh, clinical variables. Great. So next question: During training of the model. Did you train the whole network together or did you freeze the feature extract feature extractor and then just train the modality specific branches um, afterwards? Yeah, good question. So the one thing we froze, the one thing we froze here was the convolutional layers. Um, uh, we kept those frozen, frozen throughout just because of the limited data set size uh, and, and concerns of overfitting. But in terms of the rest of the network, um, we used uh, the, the like unimodal training as to initialize the model. And then all of this, all of the embedding layers, uh, these were free to train. And actually for that um, orthogonalization loss to work, to do anything, you have to have some trainable layers in your um, unimodal network, or else um, you 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 won't be able to uh, you know enforce those those embeddings to change to uh, increase their um, uh, orthogonal orthogonality. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to keep firing away at these. There's quite quite a bit of interest, Great. obviously, in your talk. So um, let's try and fill these. So Roy, you asked. Um, apart from the redundancy issue you mentioned, do you think with more modalities of data, more noise might be introduced to the analysis and the model might be more easily prone to overfitting? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, that is, I, I think anytime you introduce um, a new modality, you basically, you're, you're introducing a new set of artifacts uh, to your model um, uh, uh, that um, you know are going to you know you influence your results have to be compensated for um, so absolutely I, I i think it's it's a concern and I, I i think that's something we see too and like you know uh some of the drop off when we add more modalities in, especially with the clinical variables, where I think that noise is most pronounced. Perfect. So just going to ask two more, and then we'll definitely draw the line then. So first one, <laughs> how do you know what molecular features are best to include? Is the model flexible enough to incorporate other state-of-the-art molecular features, such as epigenetics and circulating tumor DNA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, great. Um, so. Um, these, um, these like the pathology samples, um, this, uh, gene set was also, um, uh, we, we basically got this from, uh, that, that prior paper, um, they curated this 81 gene set. Um, uh, so we just use this for convenience sake, um, in terms of how I would go about selecting this gene set, um, uh, in, uh, for if I were doing this from scratch, um, for molecular data, a really easy but important first feature selection step is just a straightforward variance thresholding. Um, uh, you can not uh, weed out a lot of junk uh, with a variance threshold. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, what you'll also have in these multimodal data sets and you know, we certainly had here is there's going to be some portion for each modality. There's going to be some portion of data that doesn't have all of the modalities, but they might have the sequencing. So for instance, if I were running this study from scratch, what I might do is start with a variance threshold. And then within the proportion of patients who only have molecular data, I know that I'm not going to use them in my um, uh, fusion experiments, maybe I do um, like, uh, like, a, like a log rank test or something uh, to see which are most associated uh, with prognosis and then use that uh, within training my model in a set of data I haven't touched because it, it has all the modalities in the last year. Um, and you, yeah, and you, you also mentioned whether other types of molecular data 
can be incorporated in here. Uh, yep, uh, definitely. Um, uh, I think the the only thing you run into there is just as these this number of features increases, um, your training size is going to have to increase too. Brilliant. So the final question, and it will be good to have some um, general insight into the future. You can get your crystal ball out, maybe, Nate. <laughs> um, but if, if all of these different modalities are already collected in the clinic, first of all, what do you think the major barrier um, towards developing these multimodal models are? And two, do you see um, general prognostic models for AI always involving multimodal data in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so in terms of once you've got the data on hand, which, you know, that's a pretty big if, because I, I do think getting these data sets is uh, the, 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 the largest challenge here. Um, but once you're past that point, um, I think it then really becomes a question of, you know, um, bringing together those skill sets, um, uh, uh, you know, being able to, you know, handle, um, uh, you know, the quirks of the radiology and the pathology and, and the omics and build models that are best suited to those modalities, but also come together cohesively is, you know, not an easy task. And, and a lot of people, you know, it takes a really long time to get that level of expertise in just a single modality. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really tough to bring these skills uh, together, which is why I think, you know, um, multi-disciplinary uh, uh, collaboration is absolutely a must uh, to, to make these things happen. Um, uh, and, you know, I do, I think, I think what I foresee is that the gold standard for prognostic models where feasible will be multimodal models. But as I said before, I think that the future of these techniques is a really key part of it is gonna be around building um, uh, you know, infrastructures that can handle data missing this. And it's not a big deal if you're missing pathology or the radiology or the molecular data. So I could see a situation where, you know, maybe you have a multimodal model that's like the, the, the recommended version, but maybe you're also going to uh, the FDA or whatever regular bu regulatory body and getting that model approved for, okay, what if we don't have the radiology? What if we don't have the pathology? Because you won't always have it. And especially, you know, when we're talking about um, uh, deploying these types of models in lower to middle income current countries where they can really help. And it's even more challenging to get all of this data um, uh, collected at high quality in the same place. Great. That's fantastic. That's um, honestly a really um, brilliant presentation. I'm sure everybody really loved listening to you today, Nate. Um, so with that, Thank you so much. I had a really good time. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's the um, final seminar of this term. So anybody else that wishes to join, including you, Nate, um, will be um, resuming that in the autumn term. So thanks again, Nate. And um, add me to the mailing list. This was fun. Great. Great. See you then. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks for having Nate. me. Great Bye. presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.